This is video screen capture 3.2 for Biology 101. I had left off talking about lipids and testosterone and uh, cholesterol. One of the things I didn't put up was a picture of this male lion. The testosterone allows for the mane of the male lion to be produced. It's just a, a good example in nature. If the male lion did not produce enough testosterone, perhaps if it was castrated or for some reason just didn't develop the testes properly, it would not produce any mane. It would be maneless. And I have a picture of a female lion that would not produce as much testosterone and therefore would not have a mane. It's a good example of, in the animal kingdom of how testosterone affects development. The third organic chemical group would be protein. And protein is made up of smaller molecules called amino acids. So protein would be the polymer, the amino acids would be the monomers. There are 20 different amino acids, uh, actually 22, but uh, there are two in bacteria that we don't uh, find in other forms of life, so we generally just say there are 20. And the general chemical structure of an amino acid is found here. There's an alpha carbon in uh, the Greek system. The Greeks counted by their alphabet, so alpha means first. That's the first remaining carbon. Attached to the main carbon would be an amino group, that's the NH2, and that's how the molecule gets its name, amino acid. There's always a single hydrogen attached to the carbon, the alpha carbon. And there will be a carboxyl, COOH group, that's always attached to the central carbon. What well, varies from one amino acid to a different amino acid is what's called the R group, which means other group. There are 20 different R groups, therefore 20 different amino acids. So this is the general structure of the amino acid. And depending on what's attached as far as the R group, it may be hydrophobic, hydrophilic, that will affect whether hydrogen bonds are formed and how the amino acids will be attracted or repelled from one another. Denaturation is an important term to know, especially with proteins and then later on with nucleic acids. If you change the structure of a protein, uh, when I say change the structure, change the shape, that is said to be denaturation. And if you denature a protein, generally it will no longer function. Some denaturation events are permanent and some are temporary. Uh, sometimes they're just temporary where if you allow the protein to cool, it will go back to its original shape. But many times they are permanently restructured or reshaped and they therefore lose their function because structure and function are intertwined. Amino acids can be joined together by dehydration synthesis and again notice the OH and the H that are removed in the form of water and a larger molecule, a dipeptide, is formed and the two amino acids are joined by what's called a peptide bond which is a fairly strong bond and there's quite a bit of energy involved in making and breaking peptide bonds. Our body tends to use up uh, carbohydrates and lipids before it starts breaking down protein, but if there's not enough uh, lipid in our system, uh, stored fat, we will break down protein and um, our muscles will become smaller. There are four structures of protein as they are being produced by dehydration synthesis. Amino acids are added and you can have hundreds of amino acids making up what's called a polypeptide chain. This is a dipeptide too. Poly would be many. And many could be hundreds. I should have an illustration of a linear structure which is a primary structure. There are no attractions between the amino acids such as hydrogen bonds or any disulfide links or sulfide bridges. Just a string, a linear chain of amino acids. This is directly determined by genetics. The genetics determine the sequence of amino acids, where they're placed, and that determines eventually what kind of a protein will be formed. But to start with, just the sequence of amino acids is what's determined by genetics. Eventually, as this chain lengthens, then attractions form between different amino acids and different parts of it, and it folds into a beta pleated sheet or it curls into an alpha helix, one of those two. 
and it's considered a secondary structure. And these are held in place by hydrogen bonds between different amino acids in the given chain. As more amino acids are added, the structure becomes more complex. The helix or the uh, pleated sheath will fold on themselves to form what's called a tertiary structure. And tertiary, I don't have it here, but oftentimes it's shown with a Roman numeral three and a degree sign behind it. And here you can see where the, the, the helices and the sheet, beta pleated sheet, have folded on each other to form a tertiary protein structure. Sometimes this will be enough uh, complexity for the protein to function, but usually it has to become what's called a quaternary structure. A quaternary structure is where two or more tertiary structures join together. Here there are actually four in the hemoglobin molecule. There's a structure here. A tertiary structure here, a tertiary structure here, a tertiary structure here, and a tertiary structure here. Each one containing containing a heme, which contains iron. You see the iron atom signified. The iron is what binds oxygen. That's what makes hemoglobin so important to many living organisms, humans, and a number of animals. Humans especially we can focus on uh, the oxygen binds specifically to the heme. Carbon monoxide has a higher affinity for the iron and hemoglobin, and uh, where oxygen joins, let's go, joins, and is released, uh, carbon monoxide will have a greater tendency to stick to the iron and block the oxygen, which is why carbon monoxide at a lower concentration of oxygen can be poisonous and suffocate a person and kill them. And unfortunately, there are several carbon monoxide poisoning deaths each year in the United States. Nucleic acids would be the next group, the fourth organic chemical group, and they're made up of smaller molecules called nucleotides. Nucleotides are made up of a nitrogenous base, a sugar group, and a phosphate group. And this particular nucleotide happens to be a nucleotide of uh, adenine. It's, uh, it's got the sugar deoxyribose, and so it would be found in DNA, but not uh, RNA. RNA would have a ribose sugar. Very similar, just uh, very, very much alike, hard to tell apart. If you look closely, you can see uh, where there's a difference of an atom. The, the uh, nitrogenous base is what gives the message of life. And the sequence of that in the DNA, when we talk about DNA, becomes important. The sugar phosphate groups are just a report, uh, repeating uh, set of molecules that uh, help give shape to the molecule and hold the nitrogenous bases in place. Examples of nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. Uh, DNA tends to be larger, RNA tends to be smaller. The uh, DNA we tend to think of as being a double helix. It can be a single strand, but we tend to think of it as being a double helix. The RNA we tend to think of as being single-stranded, though it can be uh, double-stranded. This becomes especially important when you're talking about viruses, because viruses are categorized according to their genetic material. There are some DNA viruses and there are some RNA viruses. Cold and flu viruses are RNA viruses. The rabies virus is an RNA virus. And it's understood that RNA viruses tend to mutate faster and better than DNA viruses. Smallpox would be an example of a DNA virus. I mentioned the nitrogen space, the sugar and the phosphate group, making up every nucleotide, and uh, there are four different nucleotides, types of nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, adenine, and uh, cytosine. There's a, a fifth one, we find that one in uh, RNA, that is uracil, and we don't find thymine in RNA. This illustration that uh, I pulled off of the internet shows the sugar phosphate backbone of one strand of DNA. And again, we know this is DNA because it contains thiamine, 
and RNA does not contain thymine. Well, we don't see any of those cells here. So you see the A, the T, C, G, those are bases that are found in DNA. So this is just a single strand, doesn't show the other strand, strand that's, that's complementary basis to this strand that's shown. And notice there's a repeating sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. No special message in the sugar phosphate backbone, as it's referred to as. The message of life is in the sequence of these bases. And the sequence of bases determine eventually what uh, protein will be produced, which will give us our physical characteristics and determine what we are physically. So the sugar phosphate backbone is referring to the repeating sugars and phosphates that are found here. And of course these others are the nitrogenous bases. It's a little bit subtle, and you'll notice that they are different lengths and sizes. Um, adenine and guanine are considered purines. They're larger, so they stick out further. Thymine and cytosine are considered pyrimidines, and they're shorter. And so uh, thymine will tend to pair up with adenine from the other strand, and cytosine will pair up with guanine from the other strand, and it makes a nice fit. Again, DNA contains adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, but not uracil. We tend to think of this being a double helix. And it's much, much larger. It's a very, very large molecule. And RNA would just be a fraction of the size. RNA we tend to think of as being a single strand. It contains the bases adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. This is an illustration of the double helix. And you can see that the bases are arranged to the inside of the molecule, the sugar phosphate backbone to the outside. And the two strands are wound around each other in what's called a double helix. The nitrogenous bases base pair with each other. Adenine and thymine always pair up with each other. You can see that in the illustration. And cytosine and guanine always pair up with each other. Guanine is longer, cytosine is shorter, adenine is longer, thymine is shorter. And so it puts them at just the right distance so it doesn't stress the molecule too much. If um, you tried to match cytosine with thymine, it wouldn't work. It would try to pull the two strands too close together and that would stress the molecule. If you tried to match guanine and adenine together, it would push them too far apart and that uh, decreases stability. The helical structure gives stability to the DNA molecule and also these little black dots, which would be consistent with the uh, imagery in Pearson and the symbology would be that, that those represent hydrogen bonds. And so these nitrogenous bases will base pair with each other by hydrogen bonding. And it is possible to heat the molecule and to uh, break those hydrogen bonds and cause the double helix to unwind. And that is done when DNA is worked with in the lab. When we use heat to heat up the molecule and cause it to unwind and change its structure, that is a type of denatration. I talked about denatration earlier, and what I talked about earlier was with protein, protein structures. And I didn't mention the different types of denatration that can occur, but high heat is one way. That's why we boil water. It uh, denatures the proteins and enzymes. In microbes and kills them, not all of them, but most of them. It uh, will also denature the enzymes in our cells. So if a person runs a high temperature, it can cause death to cells in the body. It can cause death to brain cells. A person can suffer brain damage. In males, sometimes it will cause sterility if uh, the testes uh, heated up too much. And some males suffer from sterility later on because they've had an infection such as mumps earlier in life. Another way to denature enzymes and proteins that make up enzymes would be with uh, pH extremes, strong acids or strong bases. Uh, again, that's another way that we can control microbes. And uh, thirdly would be with uh, salt. We can add salt and that affects the hydrogen bonding between the different amino acids and then when you're talking about DNA too, but especially with proteins. So that helps to explain the, the denatration a little bit more. With the uh, DNA, 
it is the 